uh, he's going to talk about recent advances in correlated electronic structure calculations. Please. Okay, yeah, thanks, Victor. And uh, I changed my title a little bit and to reflect with some of uh, our recent progresses. Uh, it's also a little bit uh, different from the rest of the talks in terms of uh, that the focus is more on the methodology, but I want to say that Paul indeed has some uh, uh, HPC implications. The first work is uh, our recent thing, um, uh, submitted a few days ago, and uh, called a variation of Monte Carlo with a certain neural network architecture, which has uh, some advantages. And the second part, I'm going to talk about a new way of doing correlated calculations, especially effective for MP2 and RPA called the Stafford Mesh Method. Uh, so we heard some Monte Carlo talks yesterday, just to do a recap. Uh, variation of Monte Carlo, especially in the real space, uh, considered the Hamiltonian uh, that has the kinetic energy, uh, electron nuclei, electron electron, and there is a scalar for the electron the ion ion. Uh, so we would like to perform uh, the variation on minimization in the sense that we want to try some trial wave functions to minimize the energy. Uh, because the H does not depend explicitly on the spin, uh, you can separate the, all the electronic positions into the spin up part and spin down part and anti-synchronize them only conceptually later. But this allows us to compute the energy with any uh, trial wave function by averaging over the uh, so-called local energy times the probability uh, density called the PR, which is just the square uh, of the absolute value of, of psi r. Uh, and to just to do this with the many, many walkers uh, and the variation of it, adjust the tuning parameters in the wave function. Uh, this is a massively parallel procedure is very suitable for HPC and uh, very well established. Uh, the recent thing, uh, development that is pretty exciting uh, is uh, the combination of neural network consensus and the variation of Monte Carlo. To some extent, this is a uh, quite ideal uh, application for the uh, neural networks because the variation of Monte Carlo by definition is accuracy is uh, constrained by your own size and neural network is very well known to provide some pretty general answers. Uh, you can also do, do that in the real space. And so there, it doesn't necessarily suffer from the basis discretization error, as if, uh, you know, for example, if you do in the second quantized uh, language. And one of the particularly promising ones called FermiNet, there are a few, uh, there are a few other network architectures that also received a lot of attention, but I would like to particularly talk about this Fermi-Net architecture uh, by the DeepMind team. Uh, the basic idea is you start from the atomic uh, position Ri and the, uh, the electronic position with a small r. Then you form you with neural network certain one electron and the two electron streams. And the streams means that you have some uh, neural network layers from one to the other. And in the end, uh, you get a wave function. Uh, there are a few interesting features of these things. Uh, so before the last determinant part, which I'm gonna talk about it later, everything's uh, permutation equivariant satisfies the most important symmetry properties. Uh, and it, uh, another interesting thing is it doesn't have, even have a jazz flow, which is quite counterintuitive um, you know, because it is known that jazz flow comes for a very important part of the correlation energy, but this one doesn't. It doesn't explicitly enforce the Kato cusp condition either. Instead, you just put this absolute value of the differences of the electron ion position and electron electron position and let it learn. Uh, somehow this can produce very accurate absolute energies compared to the uh, Fusi I calculations, the complete basis limit. So it, it is pretty surprising. Um, so uh, what it does is uh, a lot of most of the work is spent on generating this H, which are permutation accurate variant feature vectors. After that, you just construct some pretty simply minded uh, like a single particle orbitals and get it uh, into the form of a summation of slated determinants. And this summation here can be as small as one, but 
so far in the calculations, I haven't seen those exceeding 64. So it's not a whole lot number of determinants. In terms of this performance, uh, this was uh, their published paper last year, and the preprint was available in 2019. Uh, you can see that uh, for a bunch of atoms, the correlation error, uh, the uh, correlation energy that's recovered is way larger than 99%, which is uh, really, uh, 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 really promising. And you can also apply these things to some uh, prototypical strongly correlated systems, such as H4, and you can see that compared with the full CI uh, complete basis limited extrapolation, the error of the Fermi net is really small. And on the other hand, if you use some other methods that are not so suitable for the strongly correlated calculations, such as CCSD or even CCSDT, uh, the, the error is much larger. Uh, what is kind of interesting is that you can also use this to like a break bond of N2. Uh, there, they compare the Fermi-Net with uh, the experiment, uh, UCCSD, and also a very accurate R12 MR CPS, which is the best available theoretical methods. Uh, for most of the regimes, it's remarkably accurate, but also in this regime, in the dissociating regime, the stretched on regime, the error is still kind of like large. And later, this is one of our motivations. Want to understand the representation power of this answer uh, uh, by running a few diagnostic tools and how to improve it. Uh, so to this end, we proposed uh, this so-called generic anti-symmetrization layer. So the basic idea is the following. There are a lot of empirical evidences and some theoretical evidences saying that the Fermanet uh, the permutation equivariant part is pretty good. We, from Fermanent, we don't know, but those constructions seems to be pretty solid. The anti-symmetric part, on the other hand, is pretty shaky. And it uses a very simple ANSAS, and which is a, a one determinant or something like that, uh, to uh, represent uh, general anti-symmetric functions, which is not necessarily universal, really. I mean, for if you just give a single determinant, it's absolutely not universal. So what we want to do is to use the very expressive uh, Fermi net uh, like feature vectors and apply a very generic anti-symmetrization layer. It can be very costly, but nonetheless, it is very generic. So uh, we can try to analyze the error, remaining error in the Fermanet architecture. So we came up with this uh, called the explicitly anti-symmetrizing uh, layer, which means the idea is very simple conceptually. Uh, you take all those feature vectors and uh, which are uh, equivalent with respect to the permutation of the electrons. Uh, then you apply a universal fully connected neural network to it. Uh, it won't satisfy the symmetry properties. That's okay. You apply all sorts of permutations to it and add them up. Then it will be uh, anti-symmetric by construction. Uh, the downside of this is the cost uh, straightforwardly increases combinatorially, uh, actually factorially. Uh, but the upside is you're, once you do this, you pretty much you're free of the error in this anti-symmetrization layer. Uh, well, this is what we got. Uh, on the left-hand side is the H4, uh, this uh, strongly correlated regime. And you can see that uh, the Fermanet one determinant, the error is still pretty sizable. Uh, but as soon as you increase the number of determinants, uh, the error is pretty much as no, as nothing. Uh, and uh, there are some, uh, this is the generic anti-symmetrization layer. This FA, called a factorized anti-symmetrization, I'm going to talk about that later. And these are obtained from, uh, oh, sorry, the Fermi-Net uh, like, uh, constructions, standard determinants. There's also a new thing called uh, a full determinant mode, which I'm going to discuss later. And you go to a larger stress regime. Again, the error is pretty much non-existent. Um, you can also apply this to um, uh, the a few atoms because of the calculation is so expensive we couldn't get beyond oxygen as a matter of fact for oxygen we're not even sure uh, the uh, 
uh, it, the network is fully uh, like optimized. But this is the line of 99% of the correlation energy. And you can see that, the, yeah, so this method is much more accurate and uh, definitely much more accurate than one determined Fermanet. Uh, so this in particular uh, kind of in practice shows that uh, the one Fermanet determinant is very unlikely to be universal. Uh, um, as opposed to some other claims uh, in the literature. So then we want to understand what is actually limiting the accuracy of this uh, Fermanet structure. We realize that this is actually related to a very subtle issue called the product structure of the pseudo spins. Um, so the Fermanet, it does this uh, kind of like a product structure of two determinants, which is very natural if you think in terms of the um, if you think in terms of the, uh, the standard of BMC, uh, then we generalize this as much as possible within this product structure, uh, which is you for, for each of this uh, uh, feature and you really fully anti-symmetrize, uh, but you still keep this product structure. That's called a factorized anti-symmetrization. Still, cost is factorially large. This is very expensive on SAS. Then you have even more slightly expensive on task of the generic and symmetrization. And then there is a, uh, the, so the difference between these two is that you don't have this product structure. Then that inspired us to uh, uh, come up with this so-called full determinant mode forming that, which gets rid of this, um, uh, gets rid of this product structure. Then we realized that it was uh, appeared in a commit on the GitHub repo of uh, like last year in DeepMind's team, um, but they, they have not reported the performance of uh, this mode and we reported the performance in this paper. So, um, uh, so you have seen that from the previous slide that even though like the two of them, the cost grows factorially, uh, but the, in terms of the accuracy, they differ a lot, okay? So just by going from the FA to GA, the cost really tremendously uh, like is reduced. We want to understand why, and for this, we try to look at the evolution of the nodal surfaces uh, like along the training trajectory. Uh, uh, for this, is like uh, this is the number of epochs. Uh, for a small system like a lithium atom, pretty much everything converges to a ball. Uh, and this is a 3D cross section by fixing uh, or the uh, letting one electron move and the other electrons get into their uh, fixed position. Uh, but for the slightly more complicated beryllium atom, things become very different. Uh, if you randomly choose the positions of the other electrons, you still get a ball. But if you choose certain configurations with the symmetry, you realize that this Fermanet and FA, they look a lot like the same. I mean, so even a little bit like uh, those things uh, from uh, general relativity, uh, like uh, uh, yeah, curved space. But this is qualitatively different from the GA and the Fermanet one food determinant. Uh, there is also a video where you can see that more clearly. So let me try to share it. Uh, it is on YouTube. Uh, let me see whether I can share this. Can you see this? The window? Yes. Okay, yeah, let me play. So this is a Fermanet with one determinant uh, for beryllium. You can see that this is clearly like there are two nodal surfaces, okay? And uh, now you go to this factorially costly, factorized and has neutralization. Although the cost is way, way larger, uh, the shape of the nodal surface is even quantitatively like, similar to that Fermanet. This is the one full determinant. And you can see qualitatively, there is only one piece of the nodal surface rather than two separate pieces. And now you look at the most general one. And again, the one full determinant agrees remarkably well with uh, this uh, GA, which only has one piece. And the fact that it has one piece actually agrees more with the chemical uh, intuition, which is related to the so-called tiling property. So, um, uh, so this is interesting because it says that, uh, I mean, how would you get like a two pieces? 
we're computing a node, right? The easiest way to get this like a two surfaces uh, belonging to the node is really to have a product. So if you have A times AR times BR equals a zero, then you have an AR equals zero or BR equals zero. Then you have the union of the two. So it seems like the product structure, the pseudo spin is really the culprit. So uh, then we, I mean, we would like to apply GA to the stretched N2, but uh, the cost is too large. Maybe with a supercomputer, we can do it one day, but I couldn't do it right now. But now we can do this uh, test, uh, this uh, one full determinant mode compared with everything we had so far. You can see that uh, in terms of the error compared to the best available theoretical methods, uh, the one full determinant is like, uh, uh, like a 0 0.01 heart rate away uh, in terms of accuracy. And this is the dashed line is chemical accuracy. And all the other calculations, including the largest calculations so far obtained with FirmNet with the six of four determinants. They are, they are way above the chemical accuracy. And this one uh, uh, with one full determinant, you actually reach the error, which is 0 0.4 k tau per mole. Um, so this is really, uh, and this is at the stretch of the configuration. To us, this is astonishing and uh, uh, really indicates that something uh, fundamentally must be going right here and that we're investigating this further. Uh, so the conclusion for this part is that uh, there are uh, claims in literature saying that the single standard formula could be universal, but we think this is probably not the case, but we couldn't rule out that a full single determinant becomes universal. If so, that would have tremendous theoretical and practical implications. Um, and uh, Hopefully in the future with a like a supercomputer, we can try to scale this up. This uh, generic and asymmetrization for larger molecules, um, eventually working towards N2. It's gonna be a very costly calculation, but back of envelope calculation shows that could be doable. And uh, again, if this thing can be true, it might be a starting point to build towards really massive parallel library. Before I go to the second part, I want to just uh, stop for a second and ask whether there are questions from the audience. I have a question. Yeah. And so that's probably trivial, but can you comment on the origin of the cost? Origin of the factorial cost? Yeah, the remaining so cost it is that. Oh, the remaining or the factorial cost? Uh, sorry. Yes, answer the factorial cost. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, there is a factorial thing, but that's just a single layer. The rest of this thing is, is okay. This definitely scales polynomially. And uh, yeah, they, they are very much like the traditional VMC calculation. It's, a, it's this single layer that is really, really costly. Yeah, so, and uh, can I really believe you can just uh, brute force it with the supercomputer and with the right programming model. I mean, it's just a, you just to have a flow of things and have a bunch of numbers waiting there. You just need to crunch the numbers and like close your eyes and do all sorts of permutation with these fixed numbers, apply a very small uh, like uh, FCN. And I, I really think that, yeah, uh, that can be just, uh, just uh, done by brute force. But you might need double precision because there's also an enormous amount of cancellation uh, parts of the uh, like uh, the sign problem. Thanks. Thanks. It's a good question. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Let me talk about the second part, uh, which is um, uh, sort of staggered mesh method. And uh, so this is about uh, try to understand the final size effects. Even with a supercomputer, uh, and as I was discussing with Victor in the uh, in the breakout room earlier, even with a supercomputer, you still want to make your supercell like as small as possible, especially when you deal with the crystals. But this is not always very obvious how to do it. It sounds like with a crystal, you should be able to use a small cell, but, but no. Finite size errors just appear uh, in many, many different ways. One of them is the MP2. Let's start with the simplest correlated theory, which is MP2, uh, but for solids. Then you just uh, generalize your 
you know, standard MP2 theory with all the KIH, KJ, K, KB indices. And they correspond to the uh, ring diagram and the exchange diagram. Uh, so what we're interested in is to take the number of K points, go to infinity, and uh, uh, approach the thermodynamic limit. This has become more and more popular in the past decade because of the improvement of the algorithms and the improvement of the computational power. Uh, but understanding the finite size error of MP2 and actually for solid state systems in general is, to my knowledge, pretty limited. Um, there have been a number of correction schemes and analysis applied to different like special cases, but uh, as far as I know, there's no general analysis. Um, there are some things for quantum Monte Carlo, for Fox exchange in the real space. Uh, there's some uh, extrapolation based method for MP2, uh, but it's uh, uh, not very systematic. Uh, but one of the best references I found in this is actually a pretty old paper uh, by Fraser folks at all in the mid 90s and uh, for quantum Monte Carlo, but uh, it's a very, very well written. Paper. Uh, many other people also contributed later. Um, uh, our main result, uh, which uh, in a separate theory paper uh, we submitted earlier in August, uh, is that is to perform uh, the first unified analysis um, of finite size errors for the Hartree Fock and MP2. As far as we know, there's just a, even for Hartree Fock, there's no rigorous error analysis. Um, by analyzing the quadrature error. So we're really surprised about that. There are some versions of that for certain system in the real space, but uh, not in the case space. For MP2, just no. Um, it's based on the quadrature error analysis. And uh, they all, in the end, take the unsurprising form. Uh, that is, the error converges like nk to the minus alpha power, and uh, nk is number of uh, k points uh, in the burning zone. The question is, what is the uh, power of alpha? Uh, so if you use the standard monk, monk forest pack mesh, uh, then uh, the, uh, usually alpha equals to one. As a, uh, I mean, this is not surprising at all from physical perspective, uh, but in terms of the error analysis, it's actually not, if you use a naive way to analyze it, it's not even clear you can get any accuracy. It actually has some very delicate uh, analysis of the uh, uh, like a certain type of uh, integral, um, the quadrature errors for singular uh, integrands, which is uh, detailed in this paper. Uh, but in this paper, we propose this a new method, which is extremely simple to implement, but it's quite effective, a new method called staggered mesh method. Com uh, there's uh, almost no additional cost, uh, as we'll see uh, uh, pretty quickly. And it is a probably, it doesn't do harm uh, attemptatically. Uh, and uh, you can lead to a higher convergence rate. Uh, and what it means is also summarized in this uh, theory paper. Uh, this talk, I'm, I don't have time for that, and I'll only show some numerical results. Uh, let me show what is the method. Method can be amply uh, like, uh, uh, described by this picture. Usually, when we do a monk host uh, pack mesh, we have a uniform grid for all the orbitals. We can shift it uh, somewhere. Uh, especially to avoid high symmetry points like Obama. And then we are free to go. We compute the occupied and the virtual orbitals on this mesh, and we do everything afterwards. The idea of staggered mesh is to say that, for, at least for certain calculations, definitely not for all calculations, for certain calculations, including MP2 and RPA as a, uh, like a, a important examples, it is very much beneficial to let the occupied orbitals and virtual orbitals live on two different meshes. The idea is that you want to avoid the vertical excitation from uh, occupied at k to a virtual of the same k. And the reason is this zero momentum transfer modes uh, will lead to additional corrections for the Coulomb kernel. And that will just give you a lot of troubles later. But if you just separate them in this MP2 or RPA type of theories, uh, this problem would evaporate by itself. You don't need to do any further corrections, just it's gone, okay? So let me show you what, what I mean here. So these are uh, calculations done in PySF 
And quasi 1D uh, system means that you take a 3D system and only increase K along one direction. Quasi 2D means you uh, increase K along two directions. 3D is 3D. You increase K along all three directions. And you can see that for 1D, uh, for H2 and the diamond, we have many more examples in the paper. The only change is you go from the standard mesh to sta staggered mesh. But in terms of the correlation energy, this one has a, a, a one over NK uh, like uh, scaling. And this one is pretty much converged uh, when you have like three by three, uh, like three K points. Uh, and uh, uh, also this one, uh, you can see that for diamond, you pretty much uh, get improvements everywhere. Uh, this is interesting because the standard mesh improves a little bit, but it was not significant. Uh, and this, we also have a quantitative understanding why this is the case. It has uh, uh, something to do with the intrinsic anastropicity of the system, uh, uh, which means that the staggered mesh methods, they're particularly effective for certain systems with high symmetries, such as diamond. And uh, this is anastropic, this is isotropic. Uh, we also analyzed in a recent paper, uh, actually uh, just accepted by JCTC like two hours ago. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, for RPA. Uh, and uh, the, for the RPA calculation, uh, you can uh, do it in several different equivalent formalisms, such as direct ring couple cluster doubles or the adiabatic connection uh, formalism. They are very different in terms of implementation, but they're equivalent theories. Uh, so uh, we did both and found that the improvement is uh, very, very consistent. It also works with other seven other screen exchange formalisms, especially start with the DRCCD formulation. Uh, get, you will get the improvements uh, with respect to the SOSEX energies right away. Um, it also outperforms uh, widely used technique uh, uh, for GW calculations, for the headwind corrections. And we pretty much, uh, yeah, I think we showed that for RPA correlation energy, not the orbital energy, for correlation uh, total uh, energy calculation, the headwind correction doesn't do much, but the standard standard mesh does much better. And this is, again, the comparative studies. Uh, the difference is that, uh, I mean, for the quasi 2 dh 2 even for the uh, ionosotropic system, the improvement is pretty uh, uh, is pretty good. So uh, some of our recent works is really try to uh, ex uh, uh, extend such ideas uh, towards more general things such as GW and, or other orbital uh, uh, like orbital energies. It turns out that in such theories, uh, things become much more complicated. Uh, so here I'm just showing you, so the, the, the absolute value don't mean anything, you know, even though it's like 3D, H2, uh, because this is only showing the contribution to the v, uh, GW corrected VBM, CBM uh, for like one imaginary frequency. You later you need to sum them up and go to analytic continuation towards the real axis. But this is really the meat. Uh, so uh, what we understand is that if you do the standard methods, there's a huge uh, correction that's needed. With the so-called headwind correction, like things become better. But if you just do stagger mesh for this alone, uh, it doesn't uh, work that well. And we also understand why. Uh, because this is because that the GW method, I mean, it's a, uh, has this screen exchange part that requires special treatment. And that's indeed what the headwind correction is doing. But if you apply a different technique called the Madeline custom correction, uh, and you can see that this really has this beautiful convergence curve. Um, well, well, if every system looked like that, I would be extremely delighted. But uh, there are some other cases which don't look like completely like this, and we don't have a good understanding. We're still working on this. Uh, so let me conclude this part. I think understanding the finite size error is very important for correlated electron structural calculations, whether it's a small scale or large scale. Uh, and uh, uh, our understanding is the key is to understand certain quadrature errors. This is quite different uh, from uh, the previous studies. And we think that in terms of the technical, on the technical aspects, we made some significant progress along this direction. But many things are unknown. 
uh, one take-home message for this part is the staggering mesh is very simple to implement and effective for at least for certain system. What are the certain systems? Now we have some good understanding of a fog and uh, uh, matrix, which is easy. Uh, and uh, then MP2 and RPA, we kind of understand what's going on now. We're working towards GW. Interestingly, if you go to MP3 or more than MPN, things, the landscape changes completely. You're going to the backside of the mountain. And uh, the, yeah, that requires much more work, we think. And uh, in the when all of this would uh, uh, go to a couple cluster, which has all sorts of difficulties, perhaps, and so far. Uh, but we believe, we, we think there might be a path like, uh, forward. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ling, for this interesting talk. So we have time for one quick question, Volker. Yeah, this time, this time I'm applauding and uh, have a question. Oh, thanks. Uh, originally, which is the on the headwind corrections? I thought yeah. that the limit of uh, the dielectric uh, function or constant uh, for the headwind correction should be pretty much should pretty much take out the diverg divergent term exactly for GW and RPA. Uh, actually, no. Uh, so the headwind corrections try to get rid of the very bad part, which is n to the minus one third. This is similar to the Hartree Fock calculation. If you don't do anything to the exchange, it goes like n to the minus n k to the minus one third, which is a, which is a, which is catastrophically bad, right? And uh, uh, but with the n to the n k to the minus one third gone you're into the old business, which is there's a still a one over NK term. And I believe uh, the headwind doesn't do anything to that. And uh, so the staggered mesh together with this, this manual correction does a similar thing to the headwind, but the staggered mesh uh, uh, can uh, hope to improve uh, on top of this uh, NK to the minus one part. Which is why. So is the, is, 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 the dielectric, is the dielectric function accounted for in correction? I mean, that's that's the type of correction that we're applying here, right? Sorry, I didn't, yeah, I didn't see the Yeah, yeah. So, so for GW, yeah. there are just the two layers of things. One is you need to get rid of the NK to the minus one third. Mm -hmm. That just, you have to do it somehow, otherwise, you get this kind of stuff. So once that is done, you're in this business. So if this were NK to the minus one third, you won't see the error look like a 0 0.004. You would like the zero error look like 0 0.8 or something, sure. Sure. right? Sure. Yeah. So, so, so this is like NK to the minus one term. And the staggered mesh in some cases even can get rid of this NK to the minus one. And probably in some cases it's NK to the minus uh, 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 three fifth and uh, 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 sorry, 35 thirds. And sometimes it's even super algebraic, like for these cases. So, uh, so, so it's a combination of several things. And we think that such such kind of corrections could be particularly useful for, um, for example, two D and quasi two D systems where the understanding is uh, poorer, mm -hmm. because. Uh, uh, this uh, Madeline correction, the stagger, it really is very much, uh, it doesn't care like what, uh, uh, what's the uh, dimension of the system. Yeah, sorry, Lin and Poker, we have to stop the discussion, but you can continue in the chat. So let's move on to our 